Today we will have two very exciting talks. The first talk will be given by Burley from Strange Words, the keynote about quantum computing. And after that, you will have a crash course in quantum mechanics uh, presented by Shaima Saman Ahmad. It is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Burley, founder and CEO of Strange Works. In quantum computing, Burley actually doesn't require any introduction. He is well-known founder and CEO of Strangeworks, making quantum computing accessible and convenient for everyone. Also, in the entrepreneurial scene, he is a very well-known person, having started two successful startups previously. Chaotic Moon Studios, focused on mobile software design and development, acquired by Accenture. And Honest Dollar, which was focused on financial technology and acquired by Goldman Sachs. Also, he is, and brace yourselves, he is an Eisenhower Fellow, Innovator in Residence at the Sloan School of Management at MIT, Senior Member of IEEE, Chairman of Quantum Computing Standards and Work Group at IEEE. I like that as a NIST person that you also focus on standards. Ambassador to CERN and Society. And he wrote several books of which you might know one, totally also in the realm of making quantum computing accessible, namely quantum computing for babies. So, in his keynote lecture, he will take you from the quantum computing for babies to the big potential of quantum computing that it will have now and in the future. Very happy and honored to have you here, Worley, and please take it away with your keynote. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for having me. I am speaking you, to you today from uh, Tokyo, Japan, uh, where it is just a little past midnight. It's been a very long day, so you have to excuse the roughness of the presentation. Uh, but hopefully, uh, I can do exactly what Marlo just described and take you a little bit of an intro into some history of quantum computing, kind of where it's at, why it's exciting, explain to you some basics of how these things are, are valuable to our world uh, in the environment in you know new forms of medicine and potentially curing disease in all of these different areas and so uh, what i wanted to start with is a, a kind of blatant statement that i use all the time which which upsets some people and if it upsets you i apologize but um you know the fact is is that i believe quantum computing uh, not artificial intelligence is the space race of this generation um, I say that because I don't believe there is a true artificial intelligence that exists right now. Uh, I'm using a bunch of them, and they're very fascinating software tools. And I believe that to uh, achieve uh, true artificial intelligence, you have to have some form of uh, quantum computing. There's just no way around it. And so that said, um, it's a very uh, exciting time to be in this industry. And the way I like to look at it is you're probably... Uh, in, in your position right now, in your life and career, in the perfect position to be one of the leaders, one of the people who drives this industry forward, uh, uh, you know, in the future. This is super, super important because I think that uh, timing is is right for quantum computing. I believe that 1963 uh, resembles a lot 2023, and that is to say that 1958-59, a gentleman named Jack Kilby made a thing called the integrated circuit. And by 1963, it had been kind of adopted and was being expanded. This didn't mean we had the laptops I'm talking on to you today or iPhones or supercomputers, but it's what set us on that path. And I believe 2023 is the year that quantum computing will get set on that path. That doesn't mean there'll be a general purpose quantum computer. That doesn't mean that there'll be a, a, some giant breakthrough necessarily, but it's kind of a starting gun for an industry, uh, not a finishing line. It's very important that you think about uh, where that's it in the timing of your career, because I am very old, so I'm doing this in the later stages of my career, uh, and the advances that will be made in the next 10 or 15 years, you will all be able to take advantage of uh, and use to not only help change the world to hopefully make it a much better place, but to drive your careers and your aspirations as well. So um, where did this all start? Uh, 1929, at the fifth Solvoy Conference, uh, Schrodinger and Heisenberg and Einstein and a bunch of famous physicists that you've heard of all got together and kind of quantum mechanics was born. Um, they uh, came up with all of the concepts, a lot of the general ideas, uh, and this is where you know, it's generally accepted. This all became uh, sort of real. Uh, a few of them were skeptics. Uh, others of them were super ambitious about it. Uh, but you have to fast forward all the way to 1980 when Feynman and Binioff published their paper on the computer as a physical system. 
uh, and thinking of information as physical. We think of information, we always say digital, 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 you know, it's all this digital information. And the reality is, if we looked down into the processor on this computer or your phone, uh, there would be little electrons being held and suspended and manipulated, and that information is physical. And so in this paper, they thought about using a, a block sphere, if you will, instead of a bit. The way I like to explain that is uh, if I took a coin and I put it in my palm, heads up, it's a tail, it's a one, tails up, it's a zero. In that two-dimensional plane, it can only be one of those two binary states. If I take that same coin and I flip it in the air, when it's at the apex of that spin, it's in a quantum superposition of some uh, probability of a one or a zero. Now, there's a lot of missing quantum computing. One thing you'll hear is that superposition allows it to be a one or a zero or anything in between or whatever. Just think of it more as probabilities. <clears throat> and I'll give you an example of that in a moment. So uh, where are we at? Well, the industry is moving extremely, extremely fast. Uh, I started researching this probably about eight or nine years ago. Um, I started working in it around six years ago. And, uh, you know, we're about four, a little over four years into the company. Uh, when we started, there weren't 229 startups that you see on my screen now. There were probably 13 to 15. Um, so that means in the last few years, uh, the space has exploded. Uh, now, these 229 startups are part of a larger group of almost 900 startups worldwide uh, or people trying to make startups to do quantum computing and quantum computing related activities. When I say the 229, the reason we use that number is that's the number of companies that have more than three people that have more than $3 million in funding to do their job. So it's a very big deal if you think about it. It's explosive, explosive growth in, in such a short time. Now, as far as university programs, when we started, there were only four master degree programs in quantum information science. Uh, now they're over 37. And uh, by our tracking, by next year, there will be you know almost 60, by the year after almost 100 uh, different programs around the world. Uh, there were only three types of technologies, and I'll tell you a little bit about those uh, when we talk about how these machines work, but uh, three, there were annealers, there were superconducting circuits, and there were ion traps. Now there's cold atoms and uh, people using helium electrons and uh, photonics and all manner of ways to build these machines. And so this is an incredibly exciting time to be in this space. Uh, there were no publicly tra com traded companies when we started. There are now three, about to be potentially four. Um, and funding, if you look over on the right side of that side, when we started, there was 20 billion that had been invested in the entire history of quantum computing. An additional $10 billion has been come into, brought into the space in the last four years that I've been working in it. That is two and a half billion dollars a year coming into this space. That is incredible for an emerging technology space. And really, really fascinating to me. We'll talk a little bit more about funding later on. So, you know, getting into that right now, uh, from 2015 to 2019, you only had about $700 million uh, invested in space. That grew to about $900 million in 2020. And what's fascinating is last year, there was $3.2 billion invested in quantum computing, a billion dollars of that, one third of that invested in the last three months of 2021, October, November, December. That's incredible. And in Q1 of this year, we had reached almost a billion already. And of course there was a, with several startups that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. So when those numbers come out, I think you'll see this trend continuing to go up. Now, the caveat is I do believe this will be affected by the public markets and the economic downturn that we're going through now. Uh, I do not think it's necessarily, uh, you know, so strong that it can escape that. I don't think anything is, but I think you'll continue to see this amazing progress, this amazing trajectory for you know, the number of university programs, the number of startups getting into the space, the number of fundings, the number of governments, uh, and just overall this space kind of exploding, which presents a ton of opportunities. And I'll talk about those and why it's important for you to participate in quantum computing later in the deck. Um, one of the things that got me very excited is uh, last year, CNBC and several news uh, outlets started covering quantum computing on a fairly regular basis. Uh, this is super exciting. Um, this is quantum computing going mainstream. 
Uh, they're talking about the investments, they're talking about the companies, they're talking about the universities. It's super, super exciting. And they're talking about the areas that it can be affected. If you look down in the lower right there, um, you know, pharma uh, pharmaceutical, healthcare, biotech, climate tech, these are just a few of the spaces. And later I'll give you some actual examples of quantum projects today that have produced results that, uh, you know, maybe will give you some inspiration as to where you might take this technology. So one of the things uh, we used to say on this slide is, you know, uh, even these two, some things can agree, but it doesn't matter about politics globally, whether you're in China, you're in England, you're in Germany, uh, Finland, all countries are trying the hardest they can to invest in these technologies, not just because of the national security implications, but also because of the fact that this is going to be the next big economy. Um, think about the economic climate we're in, and then think about uh, how we had the Great Depression, and you kind of had the Industrial Revolution kind of kind of helping get past that. And then, of course, in the 70s, we had an economic downturn. You had the Information Revolution, kind of the new technology that led us out of that. Now we have whatever this downturn you want is going to be called historically, and I believe quantum technologies, not just computing, but sensing uh, you know, and communications, quantum internet, if you will, and we'll talk about that later, are going to be what drives us into the future and, and out of the kind of the economic turmoil facing. Both of the administrations, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration here in the US, invested billions of dollars into quantum computing. So regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of what, uh, you know, country you're in, everyone is starting to realize exactly how important this technology is and everyone wants their company, their country, uh, their organization to be the leader in this technology. So this is a huge, huge opportunity for students such as yourself. But you know, when will quantum computing arrive? Everybody asks this all the time. And if you go and you use Google or you look, you're going to find that there are a million different opinions and answers out there. So the way we look at it at Strangeworks is, the pessimists think it's about nine years out, somewhere around the end of this decade. Um, optimists think it's you know maybe two to three years out. We believe that the realists are preparing today. The reason I say that is when we first started this company, I wanted to take young students like yourselves, and I wanted to take people that were software developers and companies and turn them into quantum developers. And much like in the early days of computing, where you needed to be an electrical engineer to understand the flow of electricity between the gates to program a machine. Today, it really helps to have that physics background if you're gonna directly be programming those machines. Now, that's not gonna be the only job in this industry. There are gonna be hundreds of different jobs, and I'll talk about those at the end of the presentation, but it's something that you want to get in today. It's, um, think of it like trading a stock. By the time you've heard that it's a great trade, it's too late. Don't wait until you hear about all your friends having jobs in quantum computing or making progress in the field, et cetera, et cetera, for you to get involved. Be a leader, go out, get involved today. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer questions if you wanna start typing in the chat on how you can get involved or anything specific about what might help your careers. So quantum computing, maybe it comes in nine years, maybe it comes in three years, maybe it comes at some point today. The way I like to put it is, it's going to come between tomorrow and some tomorrow in the not so distant future. And that's because we just don't know. Unlike classical computing, this isn't going to follow the same trajectory. Um, you had the integrated circuit coming into popularity in the early 60s. And of course, you had the personal computing revolution on, on the mainframes. But what we didn't do is we didn't really use computers in the engineering of computers as much as we can today. And so unlike classical machines and their trajectory in history with quantum computing, when we get a few hundred qubits and we're at uh, maybe 127 today on IBMs, they're gonna release uh, 433 by the end of the year. They're gonna release over a thousand next year. They're planning on the year after that could be somewhere between a thousand and a million. Um, this is incredible because unlike classical computers, if we have 300 qubits, we can start solving some of the problems with quantum computers and accelerating that trajectory I've been talking about. So this isn't a situation where you can just come in and, and kind of look and be a passive observer. This is something you want to be very active in. This is something you want to spend some time and, and consider even dedicating your life to if you're really into the technology and science 
because this is the next grave wave of technology for humanity. So why? Why do we need it? Well, think about computers like wagons, right? So we had the, the, the abacus and it's kind of like a, a wagon and then we get the personal computers and the supercomputers we have now, like a train. In the US, it used to take weeks or months to cross from New York to California. And then we had the train and that same trip only took five or six days. But no matter how far you go, eventually you reach an ocean. And that's where we have air travel. And that's kind of a good way to think of quantum computers. Why? Because planes didn't replace trains, they augmented them. And right now to use a quantum computer, you need a classical computer to help manage it. And you will probably always use some hybrid solution of classical quantum. I'm gonna show you a few calculations in a, in a few moments. One of them is called Shor's algorithm, which I'll explain in a, in a, again shortly. But when you program this, there are only five steps. Only one of them is the step that you need the quantum computer for. It would be a waste of time and resource to program all five. I could write you an iPhone app that could do the rest. You'll see just how simple that is shortly. But this is incredible to think about. This is a completely new way to look at computing. It is a completely new form. It's the first non von Neumann architecture for computers that we will use to solve a lot of the world's problems. You need to hear me say that a lot, but this is just cannot be expressed enough how amazing of an opportunity you have sitting right before you. An early field funded with tens of billions of dollars with very few real leaders with tons of problems and opportunities and at your age as students, a 20, 30, 40, 50 year career path uh, that will continue to grow. So it's a really amazing opportunity. And why do we need these computers? Well, you know, okay, that all sounds exciting. It's hot, what is it actually? Let's talk about, you know, qubits and how they work and why these things are so powerful. You hear about quantum computers being millions of times more faster than uh, regular computers. It's a little bit misleading. So let's clear some of that up. Basically, and my ne the next presenter is going to talk in depth about quantum mechanics. I am not. Uh, it's a two-level quantum mechanical system that allows for superposition. Instead of that coin, think of it like a soccer ball or a football, depending on where you're at. And then it, measuring that superposition gives you some probabilistic outcome of a one or a zero. So if you think of a soccer ball, pointing directly up is a one and pointing directly down is a zero, we can orient that block sphere in any direction we want. And we can use that to build calculations. Why are these so powerful? Like this is, you know, am I making any sense? Think about it this way. If you have four bits, same components that your iPhones, your Samsung, Android phones, whatever you have, all the way up to the greatest supercomputer you use, you can have 16 possible outcomes. And that computer can be in any one of those 16 outcomes at any given moment in time. However, if we have a qubit, and we have four qubits, those qubits can be in all 16 outcomes at the same instance in time. A big, nice way to look at this is like, say that you have my name, but you don't have my phone number. You have a phone book and you're gonna search through it with a classical computer. It goes line by line by line till it finds a match and then it delivers it to you. A quantum computer would only need the square root of the number of entries to get to the same result. So when we think of quantum computers as being faster, don't think of them as they're not going to make the you know, videos on YouTube faster. It's not clock speed. It's that there are problems in our world that you know some people use a traveling salesman as an example. So I'll use that, uh, where when you add a few numbers of variables, the evaluation time of the computer takes forever. So it's not that quantum computers do things that classical computers can't do. It's that classical computers might take hundreds or thousands or millions or tens or hundreds of millions of years to get to the same answer. If you think about the traveling sales pro uh, person problem, say that we want to travel to 14 cities and we want to find the most optimized path to travel to those cities. I write a script on my laptop in two or 3,000 seconds, I can have that problem solved. Now, let's say we go from 14 cities to 22, a difference of only eight. The same laptop I'm talking to you on would take thousands of years to get to that answer because the evaluation time would skyrocket, it would soar. This is why we need quantum computers because we have those kind of problems in 
drug discovery and curing disease. We have those problems in autonomous vehicles and routing uh, and logistics and optimization, in tons of areas. And later I'll give you exactly where it can be used and some examples of how uh, hopefully that will be inspirational to you. So let's look at that quantum algorithm I talked to you about earlier. Let's take a very simple one. Look, I barely made it out of high school. I did not go to college. Uh, so, you know, trust me, if I can do this, you 100% can. I'm sure you're far smarter than I am. Uh, but the, short, the algorithm I mentioned was Shor's algorithm. So Shor's algorithm uh, was uh, developed in 1994 by a gentleman named Peter Shor as a way of effectively uh, finding a secret cryptographic key, right? It's a factoring of a large number. So say that you have my public key and you don't have my private key, if you had a quantum computer powerful enough, and if you applied the algorithm I'm about to teach you about, you would be able to derive from the public key my private key and I would have no security or encryption. I wouldn't be able to hide anything from you. This is the main algorithm when you hear people in the press yelling and screaming and worried about all of these, you know, quantum computing is going to end encryption and everything's going to break. This is where this comes from is this one single algorithm. Now, I will tell you before we go into the algorithm that you need not worry about the negative effects of quantum computers on security because they're also going to bring you much more robust security. And when you get into things like quantum communications, which I'll give you examples of later, this is going to make it where we entangle two particles to send information. And if I try to observe it by doing that act, it collapses in and you won't be able to get that data. So things are gonna get more secure. Threat and remediation in computer security are ever evolving dance, right? They're always entwined. I build a wall, you tear it down, I build it bigger, on and on and on. But back to the algorithm. So again, Shor's algorithm, we're looking to factor a large number. Now make it simple, I've come up with, I think, a pretty easy example. Step one in the algorithm is to check if the number we're using is even or odd, right? If it's even, two is a factor. If it's not and it's odd, then we're out, okay? So, and we, we go back, we're gonna use 15 as our number here. So our starting number, our odd number that we want to start this calculation is 15. Then we wanna see if that's a product of two co-primes. So 15 is a product of two co-primes. So check, we can go to the third step. And that's where we're gonna take a random number that's not a factor to use in our calculation. I'm going to use seven in this example because it's not a factor of 15. So 15 is an odd number, is a factor of two co-primes. Seven is not a factor. And then we get to step four. This is where we find the order of R of X mod N. This is the non-deterministic quantum magic and the number of qubits you have affect the precision of the answer. And we'll talk about that at the end about the noise and the systems and kind of where we are. But this is so important. It's the only step in Shor's algorithm where we need a quantum computer. I could write you an iPhone application that was as fast as you could imagine to tell you is it an even number or odd number and is it a factor of two co-primes and what another number is. And then our last step is basically, look, do we solve it? If not, we go back and we start over. So what did that calculation do, right? 15 as our uh, odd number, uh, seven as our factor. It basically would factor 15 is three times five. And this is the same process on a large scale with a much larger quantum computer than we have today. You would be able to break encryption keys. And the reason that all these countries are driving investment is partly because of national security. Obviously, there were secrets stolen worldwide, pardon me, years ago and they're been archived it's called wait to decrypt so you steal something you can't decrypt it you wait long enough for the computing technology to catch up to it and then you can now decrypt these secrets and those secrets could be nuclear weapons they could be chemical things who knows and so yeah that's part of it but again that's such a horrible attitude to look at this thing so negatively um, the other reason that they're looking at this is this same ability these same computers can do things in drug discovery, in optimization of financial portfolios, in new forms of energy. And they are trying to create as governments quantum economies because they know that this will be the next thing. I like to liken it to, we harness the power of the atom to destroy. Now we're harnessing the power of the atom to build, to compute, to do new things, better things. So I think this is one of the biggest steps 
in computing and its history, and that this will change computing more in the next few years, probably before the end of the decade, than it's, than it's changed in its entire history. So that's a, an example, very simple, Shor's algorithm. But what's another example that might help you get inspired about how these computers can be used? Well, some of you may know something called the classical walk. Uh, the classical walk is, uh, is this example, I'm at a bar, I have all of these people in front of me, they're all wearing the same shirt, but I'm only looking for one of them. So I'm gonna walk up to one, tap them on the shoulder, and I, uh, if it's not my friend, I'm gonna flip the coin. If it's heads, I'm gonna step one step to the right, tap that person on the shoulder and go again. And if it's tails, I'm gonna do the same thing, but to the left. So this is extremely important because I have to go step, 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 step until I find the right person. What that means is that that is a standard deviation on a bell curve and the probability density is all in the middle. But as you know, in life, maybe the answers aren't right there. Maybe they're out on the edges. And so what's awesome about quantum computers is that I can have a quantum coin, meaning that I walk up behind the person, tap them on the shoulder, they're not my friend, I can flip that coin and go in both directions at the same time. Meaning, using the power of superposition, my probability density looks more like vampire fangs and less like a bell curve, and I search a larger spread of information in the same or shorter amount of time. And so what does that mean? Again, exploring more steps in the same amount of time. Uh, this is something like Grover's search algorithm, this example, uh, and several others. If you look at that little green bar for classical, that's what we could do with a classical computer. You could search a much larger space of information on a quantum computer. Well, where might you want this? You might want it in molecular sciences for material discovery. You might want it in uh, trying to find molecular bondings and pharmaceutical products. There's tons of areas where this is super, super valuable. So, you know, quantum computers aren't going to replace classical. They're not going to do everything. The things they're going to do are change the world more than you can possibly imagine. So let's talk about changing that world. Let's talk about some real world applications of quantum computing that you can use today. Then some examples of things that people have done. So like I said, I told you I'd tell you kind of where it can be used. Uh, obviously, Google is huge in quantum computing. Why? Search is still a big part of their business. And that algorithm I just talked about, Grover search algorithm, and that telephone book example I mentioned at the beginning, these are all search functions. If you think of Google improving their search, they're going to need quantum computing to improve their ability to do that search. Cryptography, obviously these computers will be big in both breaking it and making it. Data science, clearly an area where quantum computers will be extremely valuable. Logistics, it's already valuable today using what's called a quantum annealer to do optimization of routes and stuff. I'll give you some real world examples of those momentarily. Finance, there are already companies doing portfolio optimization and other functions using quantum computing or what are called quantum inspired algorithms. So in between having the computers, we're learning how to program classical computers a little bit more like quantum computers to get some advantage. And then optimization applies across all categories. And finally, one of my favorite is pharmaceuticals and material sciences. Uh, you want to think about traveling in planes that go faster and take you from New York to London faster than the Concorde and things like this. These all require new material sciences. Right? You want to talk about battling things like the coronavirus. Right, This requires new pharmaceutical processes. So very exciting that it can be applied in all of these areas. And how accurate the answers are, how much it will affect, will change over time. We're in the very early days. I want to be very clear on that. That doesn't mean it's not super exciting to get involved with this today. So a couple of examples. I'll start with Volkswagen. Uh, Volkswagen is the first automaker to demonstrate practical applications of quantum computing for route and traffic management. Why? They're a huge brand. They own Volkswagen, they own Audi, they own all these things. Tesla and Elon are not the only people that have a dream of an autonomous future. And so they have used this as a way of route planning and managing and optimization of the traffic routes for these uh, future autonomous vehicles. Super, super exciting. They're not the only ones doing it now, but they were the first. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. Mitsubishi used quantum computing to optimize the truck routes for waste collection, reducing the distance from 2,300 kilometers driven a day to only 1,000, which is clearly 
you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a physicist to understand what a big impact that is on you know the pollution in the environment on the cost of the uh, equipment every day on the, the wear and tear on the equipment etc cetera, etc cetera. this is a really good example i like this one a lot um toyota and dinzo are optimizing multimodal transportation systems so similar to what volkswagen did but doing everything from coordinating passenger and traffic flow between rideshare services and public buses to all the way up to the ports and the ships bringing product in etc cetera, etc cetera. it's very very exciting because we all want that electric autonomous future um if we, those things are not going to work on the computers that we have today. Uh, Deutsche Bahn is using quantum computing to optimize their rolling stock, right? So they're planning for 40,000 trains that travel over 5,700 miles a day. It's how do we find the most optimized path? They can do this on a supercomputer. They can do this on a compute cluster, but they can do it much better and much faster on their quantum computers. Uh, again, these are in the very early stages. These quantum computers are not where they should be. It's what we call the noisy intermediate kind of error. Uh, adding a qubit isn't hard. Adding a qubit without having so much noise in the system that you can't get an answer that makes sense. Uh, it is. And by the way, the answer you get may be different from machine to machine. And on one machine, you might run that several times to average out an answer. It's not quite the same as a classical computer when you think about it from a programming and a data uh, standpoint. Um, you know, in, in Italy, uh, FS Italian is doing the same thing, except they've expanded what they're using this to do hard optimization problems like scheduling and assigning platforms to incoming trains, deploying workers and maintenance crews, freight load distribution. Um, these are things that they're doing efficiently with quantum computers. And everything you see is an experiment, right? Uh, these are not projects that I'm saying they're 100% they use it every day. Uh, but this is something that we find the uses for these machines right now. So maybe it's not 10 years out. Maybe it's not three years out. Maybe it's about to happen sometime in the next three years. Uh, one sky is using quantum computer to discover, you know, short routes. Again, this is more autonomous vehicle uh, routing and control systems. But it's super, super big area. Autonomy is going to be very big in the future, both on planet and off planet. When you look at NASA building uh, potentially a moon base and Elon going to Mars. Uh, we're going to extend all of our problems out to the stars. And so it's really, really important that we have a compute technology capable of helping us do that as efficiently as possible. Uh, Frankfurt Airport, uh, they're using quantum computers to reduce the total passenger transit times of 170,000 passengers and 278 gates. They flow between there every day. Well, how can they make sure that when I'm traveling from Tokyo to Frankfurt, I can get off the plane and onto the other plane in the shortest distance, the most effective way, whether it's coming in through customs because I'm staying or just passing through in transit. These are problems that are far, far more complex than people understand when you start taking these mass amounts of data and trying to work on them. Um, NEC, using them for the last mile resupply problem. So how do they top, uh, basically use autonomous vehicles, <coughs> pardon me, to resupply army forces uh, from a central base? Um, interesting, right? Um, Boeing, uh, sorry, Airbus and Boeing are both doing projects, but Airbus is not just using quantum computing. They're also using quantum sensors and quantum communication uh, to apply to all of their aerospace pro uh, problems from material science to security communications for military stuff to route planning of autonomous vehicles, all of that. <coughs> so sorry, I'm allergic to something in Tokyo. I apologize. It's been making me stuffy the entire trip. Exxon's using quantum computing for route optimization problems uh, as well to challenge, solve you know, things they can't do with classical computers. Now you'll notice all of these are in this optimization space. It doesn't mean it's the only thing you can do with a quantum computer, but it's one of the things we can do now that we can do at a pretty decent scale. <coughs> Total Energies is just starting to explore quantum computing algorithms to improve their CO2 capture as they work towards carbon neutrality. And AT&T is looking at moving quantum networks out of the lab into the public internet. Uh, you may have read recently in Chicago and a couple of other places, there have been very long, 127 miles, I believe is the longest test of using entanglement, what Einstein called spooky at a distance, to be a form of communication. And it's not just AT&T, NASA is working with MIT's Lincoln Laboratory to develop a quantum laser system to help relay information from the International Space Station. 
So it's not just about computing when we talk about quantum. The job opportunities will be in computing, they'll be in building physical sensors, they'll be in doing research, they'll be in doing networking and running networks. Uh, the entire world is about to change. And even though it's easy to think, well, we have computers, these are new computers, you know, we can just, everybody working there will just transition. This is the space race of your generation. This is something that will change the balance of global power. It will change the balance of economic structure among, you know, enterprise companies. Um, it will be the, one of the most important, most impactful advances we've made as a species since we've used an abacus. It's extremely important to understand that. So one of the problems, though, is there's a big, big learning curve, right? I told you earlier, you can't just take a quantum computing developer and make them a, a regular developer, make them a quantum developer. Um, you do have to understand some of the physics. There's a lot of complexity that can be there. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way because uh, I don't think that that's fine. I don't think that we are, have enough people coming into the market. I don't think that there's enough work being done uh, to reduce the level of complexity, to add abstraction layers. That's part of why I started a software company in this space. Because, you know, uh, in the early days, I said, you have to be like Twitch or program a computer. Oh, now you don't, right? Uh, same thing's going to happen. And the same commoditization will happen, right? You can remember, I can remember, when Barnes & Noble CEO said that he didn't need a website because he had a store on every corner. Uh, how did that work out with Amazon, right? You don't want to be short-sighted on this technology. You don't want to overhype it. I'd, think, I'd say, you know, trust but verify on everything you hear in the, in the press around quantum. But it is gone. It, it has already gone from science fiction as very close to heading to science fact. We're in the point in the development of this technology. We're moving from advanced research, we're studying and experimenting, to applied research. So from physicists experimenting in the labs with all these quantum techniques to electrical engineers actually building quantum computers that we'll all be able to use. So the industry needs a lot more creativity, a lot more exploration. Uh, I started StrangeWorks as a uh, Linux Foundation project. It was going to be my retirement job. I told my wife I am not going to be working anymore. Um, I got a bunch of people together in 2017 from different quantum companies and they didn't want to work together. And so I said, ah, I guess I'll have to start another company. So I lied, but it is desperate for new visionaries. It is desperate for people to come in with different ideas, different ways to approach it. That's not to say all of my peers in quantum are great. They're not doing very interesting things, but if you think about how technical they are in such a deep space tech field, we need people that are saying, why can't I just do this with it? Why can't it just work that way? Uh, the iPhone that I'm using to time our talk on right now, uh, it came from that kind of thinking. Uh, the laptop I'm using came from that type of thinking. Want to take the computer with us. These are ideas that come from outside of industry in many, many cases. And so, you know, the industry needs ideas and creative and exploration, and it needs you. Why? Because if you look at women's representation and expertise, which is severely needed, you have 28%, uh, you know, are in a STEM profession. You have only 20% uh, with the degrees in physics, of 5% of software developers, and 10% uh, in quantum startups. Um, there's very few. Uh, you're underrepresented across the board per the usual in tech. But you have to think back to like Ada Lovelace basically invented the computer, right? Yeah, in the in the wars when computers were being built. In the world wars, the men were fighting who programmed those computers. Women did. They were the original developers, not the men. I find it so awkward that, you know, it's it's all uh, men programming these machines uh, and women can't get equal representation when they were the ones, the only ones who were doing that in the past. Um, so what does this opportunity look like size-wise? Uh, it's a very big opportunity. If you think about it from a total addressable market, you're probably looking at it growing from 90 billion to about 170 billion. People say over the next 20 years, I don't think it takes that long. I think this is a hundred billion dollar market sometime around 2035, uh, you know, to 2037. I think it's going to take off so much faster than people think. And so I cannot express enough that you take the time to look into it and really consider a career in quantum because it's a groundbreaking opportunity. It's a giant blue ocean of opportunity. You have plenty of things you can do. You don't have to be a physicist. 
You don't just have to program the machines. And I believe it's going to be the biggest shift we've seen in the economy and in computing science in the last hundred years. So it's really happening. I think we should do it together. Uh, I will have left about 15 minutes, roughly a little more for any questions or answers that you have. And with that, I will thank you for your time and stop my screen share. And we'll come back to any questions that have been being typed while we were talking. Marlu, I turn it back over to you. That was fantastic, Burley. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. And I would thank like you. to emphasize, emphasize the points that you make about don't wait. The opportunity is now and it is an exploding field, billions of dollars, and you can start this quantum journey now. You can be part from it at it from the start. Thank you so much for showing all the applications that are already happening now and all the opportunities to en enter this field. We have many questions in the Discord chat. Okay. And I will um, I will share some of them uh, with you. Um, the first one is from Lala in Cameroon. What, in your view, is the farthest advance made so far in the field of quantum computing? Oh, that's a great question. So I, I don't, I, I don't, I think right now, to me, the most exciting stuff is that we're starting to get into software advances. Um, the reason I think this is exciting is not because I work in software, but because the hardware advances are going to come, naturally come out of the universities and the physics department. The software advances are much har ha harder and they're a much larger, in my opinion, impact. The reason I say that is last December, uh, a team led by uh, some very famous physicists, John Preskill uh, being one of them, uh, create, wrote a paper and released a paper that's now in the archive, if you want to go look for it, on actual practical quantum advantage. They used uh, about 40, 40 qubits, about 1,300 experiments, and they're actually able to show we can do something on a quantum computer that we cannot do on a classical computer. The reason I say software, again, not because I'm in software, but because you have to understand that these things go together, right? Uh, software and hardware engineers, my whole career, they always argue like without the hardware, you couldn't have the software. And like without the software, you know, the hardware wouldn't work. Uh, th these are ridiculous arguments. We need both of these things. And so this is one of the first practical uh, papers that shows exactly where we can see quantum advantage using the machines we have today, not theoretical in the future with a general purpose quantum machine, but using what we have and our abilities that we have right now. So that's very exciting to me. One second. Amazing. There are uh, several questions about the advances that need to be made. Um, for example, what are the main uh, quantum hardware advances that need to be made? And Shoria Agrawal uh, in the US, which qubit technologies do you think will be the future of scalable and robust quantum computing? So this is a great question. I will, I will tell you that um, a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, we need better noise control uh, and we need uh, better error correction. Adding a qubit is not hard, but adding a qubit without the fidelity of the system becoming so bad that you can't use it to get an answer uh, is very, very commonplace. So that's really important. As far as the technologies, Look, I work with all of them and I partner with all of them. So I love them all equally. Uh, but I think if you're realistic about it right now, the ion trap technologies are probably going to, to increase the number of qubits and see more commercial use than annealers and some of the other platforms for the next few years. But I think they'll reach a hard physical barrier with the physics of, of what they're doing. Uh, that means I look towards superconducting qubits. I look towards silicon spin. And I look toward cold atom. Now, which of those three long-term has the, the most viable architecture? I don't know that the answers we get uh, on one will be the same answers on the other. Like we have it, we don't have enough software, we don't have enough problems. So maybe I use an annealer for optimization and I use a, some photonic device for some other function, or maybe as we approach it at Strangeworks, these are all part of an exotic compute infrastructure, meaning that I'm gonna use amorphic and neuromorphic, maybe I'm gonna use uh, some, you know, the new Grok processor or Tesla's new processor, NVIDIA's cards in combination with a quantum computer. And maybe I'm going to use several combinations 
uh, several quantum computers in combination with each other. And so it's very hard to say, but I think you'll see the ion trap and cold atom kind of take off. I think cold atom continues to go in the future, but I'm really excited about the superconducting circuits, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the silicon spin and the, and the cold atom as far as the ones that, that I'm watching, not necessarily rooting for, but I think will, will give us some amazing computational technologies. Great to hear. And I'm happy to share with the participants that we will have presentations about all of these technologies in the sessions coming up this week, next week, and the weeks after presented by those companies. Then we had the amazing positive, or you said realistic view today. And other people are, are less uh, realistic or optimistic. There's a question from uh, Kabir in India asking, what is the guarantee that this field may come to an end? Will we enter a quantum winter oh, instead of our summer of qubits? So this is, okay, so first of all, this is an excellent question. It is a question I speak about all over the world all the time. Um, the, the answer is yes. Um, there'll be a quantum winter, a quantum cooling. Uh, and the answer is, I think we're going through that right now. You're seeing down rounds in some of these hardware companies. You're seeing the SPACs that were worth three or four billion dollars are now worth eight hundred million dollars. So I think you're kind of seeing that cooling. This is a good thing, though. Everybody thinks of a quantum winter as a bad thing, uh, and, and I don't. It's not because I'm some hopefully optimistic person, but you've had such an explosion of growth, and with that, we know you get some fraud and maybe some science that's not so good, et cetera, et cetera. When people start tightening in on the funding, when they start doing more diligence, becoming better prepared to do this, you eliminate a lot of that from the system. And when you eliminate that from the system, you come into a situation where only kind of the strongest, the real tech, the real scientists uh, survive. And then it's kind of a reset, if you will. So I think that uh, a quantum winter is very natural. I think it should be expected, uh, but I don't think it's the end of quantum computing. If you look at something like artificial intelligence, they've been through a dozen winters, right? Uh, and now it's the biggest thing that's all we, all we hear about in, in everything from pop culture movies to job opportunities. Uh, so I think the a quantum winter is something that should be looked at as a, a positive thing, like as 100% it's going to happen. When? Who knows? My guess is, you know, it's kind of starting and it won't be this dramatic everything stops. It'll It'll just kind of like You'll see certain types of things pushed out of the system and certain people pushed out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and finance will, will change and the rules of financing uh, quantum companies will change. Uh, but I, I think it's a very positive thing. I think it's something you need if you think of quantum computing being this evolutionary step in computing. You can think of a quantum winter being this evolutionary step in the development of this, this industry. Um, it's just something that's going to happen. It needs to happen. And, and frankly, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing. Great. I like that answer and I totally agree with you. Then Hossein from Iran asks, are there IEEE-like standards for quantum computing? Okay, so there are and there aren't. And so uh, the whole bunch of other people are running that group that you mentioned earlier, the IEEE Quantum Computing Standards Work Group. And there are now two or three work groups just within the IEEE. Um, what we tried to do with that project was come up with the first standard on nomenclature because a qubit is not a qubit is not a qubit, right? If I say I have 5,000 qubits on D-Wave and 127 on IBM, I say, well, how's a company with 270, 280 million in funding over 23 years have so many more than a company spending billions of dollars a year with some of the greatest scientists in the world? Not to say that the other company doesn't have great scientists, just saying like, it makes you scratch your head. And that's because every type of qubit is different and has different powers and different abilities. And, you know, frankly, we don't know what a lot of them are. And so we tried to start with a nomenclature standard that's uh, a still a PAR, that's IEEE PAR 7130. Uh, and then we have PAR 7131, which is how do we benchmark them? Uh, you'll see plenty of people make these claims of quantum supremacy and then they get pulled back and Microsoft publishes a paper and then they retract it. And this is because we don't really have a way to fairly judge these. When you see a quantum computing company say, this is so much faster than a classical computer, Almost every time you can be guaranteed that on the quantum side, they have a highly optimized solver, they've made a lot of the paths smooth, et cetera, and then they've gotten the worst way it could be configured on the classical side. And they run those two and shock, the Ferrari beats the skateboard, right? It's like, they're, they're not comparable. Um, so, you know, this is something that's, that's really, uh, really near and dear to me. Um, the ISO has several standards they're working on. IEEE has several standards. 
Um, I think that you're going to see a lot of fighting over standards, which happens in the standards community regularly. Uh, but yes, if you want to check out the ITRA, please check out PAR 7130 and 7131. Uh, and those are part of the quantum computing work group. And that's, again, on nomenclature and on benchmarking so you can fairly compare the machines. Then we get to the last question, which is about <clears throat> career opportunities. Um, you showed that there are very few women in, in quantum, 5% uh, even in software. So I'm happy to share that we have 44% female partic participants in this program. Um, you also mentioned there are very few leaders in the field right now. What is your advice to everyone present here right now, uh, postdocs, PhD students, master students, bachelor and high school students to become the new tech leaders in this quantum computing field? Well, look, it, it's very simple. Um, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And it's like, if you want to be a leader, you have to start putting yourself out there as a leader and participating. Uh, there's a great Stack Overflow group if you want to learn on programming or software. Um, you know, IBM has a Q experience. We have a uh, free software it, it, that you can go to quantumcompeting.com and use. There's plenty of ways to start getting involved with that. Um, but it's important to note that you don't just have to be a physicist. All of these companies are going to be, need people in finance and operations and other things. And by the way, they're going to want you to understand something about the field that they're in. So there's a ton of opportunities. I think the biggest opportunities right now are in software. I think the biggest opportunities are in creating the abstraction layers so that people can use things easier without having to have so much physics knowledge and creating the control systems and the error correction that I spoke about earlier. That's one of the big barriers to really advancing this technology. Um, there are literally hundreds of things I could think of that you could do in your career. But if you wanna be a leader, then you have to decide if that's really what you want. When I was uh, younger in my career at IBM, I got promoted from a principal engineer to a manager. And the person I worked for at the time, Tom Bishop, a very famous Bell Labs guy, took me to lunch and bought margarita after margarita after margarita. And I was like, what are we doing? Like, I have to prepare. He said, I've got some stuff I want to talk to you about. And at the end of the lunch, Tom said, I want to ask you a question. Do you want to be a manager? Or do you want to do what managers do? Because those are two very different things. Being a manager, it's on my business card. I'm very proud. My, pop, my parents are proud, all this great stuff. I'm a manager. I run around. I boss people around. Doing what managers do is it, we had employees that had committed suicide. We had people that had affairs. We had tragic things dealing with those people. That was doing the job. And leadership is the same. So, you know, I ask you, do you want to be a leader in quantum computing? Or do you want to do what leaders do? Because one of these is very superficial and one of these takes a lot of time and effort and discipline and is not an easy path. And you shouldn't worry about that. Uh, startups, if you start one, are always in one of two phases. They're struggling or they're out of business, right? Um, you know, you have to look at, at how you manage your career, how you do these things very, very diligently. But you also have to look at them over a long period of time. Quantum computing isn't a career where you're going to go and make millions of dollars next year, uh, but it is going to be a career that makes billions, if not trillions of dollars for millions of people in the next 20, 30 years. So, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. But again, do you want to be a leader or do you want to do what leaders do? Because it's very, very different. What you read in the magazines, you know, I, th I always tell people, all these startup magazines, uh, Entrepreneur Magazine and Fast Company, all, these are like romance novels for startup nerds, right? Like I know people that have been on the cover and I know this story is not true, <laughs> you know? Um, you have to get out there and do real work and guess what? You will be underappreciated. Uh, it will be difficult. You will have a lot of people question it. And, you know, that's, uh, that's basically something that comes with the territory. Thank you so much for your great answers to these questions. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation and for kicking off the first uh, session with contents of this program. Well, thank, thank you, you for having and me. Again. We love to keep I... you involved. You will see Strange Works again in the hackathon and also at the career fair, where you will have more chances to uh, to interact with people at this great company. And, and I appreciate the opportunity. I am Worley on Twitter, on LinkedIn, everywhere. So feel free to add me, ask me questions if your question didn't get answered. 
I feel like it's my job to evangelize this. So I'm happy to talk to you until you are sick of hearing about quantum computing. <laughs> I had one one question. Really, uh, yes. did the username come first or your name come first? What came first? Uh, oh, what do, you, what do you mean? What was the question? No, no, really, right? You shortened your name. So I really love that. Oh, I, I didn't. Know. Okay, so so very quick story. In 1993, I went to work at Apple Computer and I, a guy was promoted into what was called the DRC, which was all of the Unix gods instead of me. And then uh, he, I got promoted about eight months later. And two friends of mine now for 30 years, Michael and Sebastian Hassinger, used to come to my cubicle face the coffee room. And they, I would go, hey, guys. And they'd be like, oh, they didn't want to deal with me. And so when they sent me into Apple's radar system, Sebastian made it my first initial last name, William Hurley, W. Hurley, Worley, like crazy guy. And they did this because they all had cool names like Draconis and Singe and all these other things. And so it used to be derogatory. And so the first 15 years of my career, I hated it. And then I went to work for a VC that said I, it had, you know, it kind of picked up in open source and people said I had to do it. And that was very interesting. And then I hosted President Obama in 2016 at South by Southwest. And he kept saying on camera, I want to thank Worley. I want to thank Worley. I want to thank Worley. So then now my mother-in-law calls me Worley. So I've just given up. But I will, <laughs> William Worley, I have no ego associated. I literally, I literally spent 15 years of my career, literally half of my career saying, please, please, please don't call me that. Please don't, like, it's, it's, it's not a good thing. So that's how that came. So I, I'm just not, now it's an accidental uh, brand, if you will. And so I'm just like, okay, great. I embrace it. <laughs> Perfect. You know, I work with Sebastian Hassan now, so this is good. I know. I should stay away from him. <laughs> no, <laughs> you should tell him. You should be worthy warned me. Actually, Sebastian and I were texting uh, yesterday. Uh, we talk several times a day. We're still best friends to this day and I, I love him. I wish I wish he was working for me and not AWS, no offense, but you know, he is he's still he's it's awesome and I'm sure he's doing amazing things. Great. And great story of the name. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Well thank you so much everybody. I will let you go. Have a wonderful time at the event. And I think this is one of the best events you could possibly be at to build your future and your career uh, as a young person in this space. It's absolutely amazing to be able to be a part of it and help kick it off. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much you again, Worley. It was a great Bye -bye. session.